quick. Sure. All right, everyone. Uh, so we are live uh, up in here. This is a this is a first um, uh, for me, and I'll uh, I'll explain why here in a second. So uh, Josh Cunningham uh, is with Rockerbox, and uh, if you've been to if you went to our last event uh, or even the last two events, you've you've sort of seen Josh uh, talk and. Um, what's really cool about what uh, Josh has done in his journey, and I really just kind of really soaked in what, what he's achieved when he told his, his personal but also his business journey at the last intensive. Um, it's, I mean, you can just see behind him the business that he's built. And if you were at the intensive, you saw his first office was just a picture of a computer screen, I think, because it was just, yeah. it was Josh, without any reason to do it, except deciding that he wanted to, to serve the real estate industry in a thing that we struggle with. And it's just the consistency of new business development. And we onboard new clients at Real Estate B-School who really struggle with a couple of things, not realizing that the business, the predictability in business is with just doing the thing that you need to do to bring in new clients every day regularly. And, um, and then also to scale a business, you need to be able to be good enough at that thing so you could train others how to do it and hold them accountable. And so uh, I thought I'd just go live inside. So the thing I've never done before is I've taken a, a quote unquote vendor um, or sponsor and brought them right live into the community. Um, and I just think it's so valuable to hear a guy who just decided he wanted to do a thing and has done a thing and he continues to be successful at it and is willing to share. What I say is the good, the bad, the ugly of your business growth journey. So Josh, why don't you give us like a, a couple minutes for those that haven't kind of heard about you or your journey, just give us an idea of who you are and uh, what you do. Sure, certainly. Thanks so much, Lars. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh Cunningham. Um, I'm coming to you live from College Station, Texas. That's where Rockerbox is located because we're right across the street from Texas A&M University. It's a very prestigious university. You got a lot of young, energetic, and enthusiastic college students looking to advance their careers and invest in themselves and um, you know, dig a little bit deeper and start to sharpen some of those skills. And that's where Rockerbox comes into play. Um, you know, they serve as our talent pool and we serve as a wonderful sort of paid internship program. Um, a lot of the students that come and work for us are looking to pursue careers in sales and real estate and um, entrepreneurship. And so, you know, getting to actually come into an organization and make phone calls and prospect and do lead follow up and learn how to effectively use a CRM and uh, keep all of your, your client uh, notes and things sorted and, and your follow up, uh, you know, uh, at immediate and persistent and consistent. Um, so a lot of the kids that graduate from, from, Texas A&M that are working at Rockerbox are walking the stage with multiple job offers. And you know, that's what we're super proud of here. But just to rewind the clock uh, even further, how we got to this point, um, Lars and I met about seven years ago in 2011. I was working with Frank Klesitz at Viral Marketing. And uh, Frank and I were traveling the country, going to all the different real estate masterminds and all the different coaching organizations, going to all their, their, their big events and stuff. And just learning how people can be more successful with, with real estate. But along the way, what we, you know, automatically learned was not only what people were doing that was that was helping them achieve success in their business but the things that were frustrating them and holding them back and so you know, that's why frank and i would always go to the conferences is to try to learn what our clients frustrations were so that we could you know help solve them through whatever marketing uh, outlets we had at viral marketing but you know back in 2011 lars you and i were sitting in one of those first boomtown masterminds in charleston south carolina there might have been 40 or 50 people in that room and uh, I remember everybody going around the room and, and talking about the one thing in their business that they're doing great at and the one thing in their business that they're really struggling. And about 80% of the room, everybody in there, a Boomtown client, was all paying for internet leads. And they were all very frustrated with the fact that the agents weren't following up with them systematically and, and, and getting the highest conversion that they could. So that was 2011. And I think there might have been two or three people in the room that whispered the phrase ISA. Uh, it was still pretty new, pretty cutting edge at that point in time that they had decided to take the leads away from the agents and just assign it to one person, an inside sales agent. And that inside sales agent would work all the leads and then dole them out to the, to the agents whenever they were you know, motivated and needed, need the expertise that only an agent can provide. And so in that mastermind, you know, after hearing an overwhelming response of people not being able to solve that problem, it kind of planted a seed in the back of my head. 
And so for the next couple of years, as I worked with viral marketing, I got to work with a lot of the top teams that were doing this internet lead conversion at a really high level and uh, started to learn what they were doing, what the things that they were avoiding. And, um, and it was about 2013, spring of, of 2013, that one of my clients, Spring Benson out of uh, Utah, uh, Salt Lake City, she essentially was ready to drop her internet leads. Like a lot of people get to that point of frustration where you keep writing checks and writing checks and writing checks and writing checks and you don't see the closings coming and she was about ready to give up on the internet leads and so I was there to provide her all the hypothetical information that I had learned and said no 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 you don't need to do that don't cancel your internet leads what you need to do is you need to hire this ISA role which I had hypothetically learned so much about and so at that point in time she said hey let's let's do this together let's you know work on this project and I'll hire someone and you can train them and we can take all these hypothetical models and start ironing it out, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And, and she's like, I want this. I need this in my business. And so we worked with, with that one ISA, that initial um, in-house hire that she had, worked with them for about two months doing you know, script and role play and training and coming up with checklists and all the sort of you know, work that needs to be completed every single day. And uh, about a month and a half into her calls, she walks into Spring's office and she said, Hey, number one, Josh is a little too hard on me. He calls me too much and wants to coach me too much, which we all know is not a bad thing. And she's like, but number two, I actually see all the money that these agents are making in the office. And I just went out this weekend and signed up for real estate classes. So there we were back to square one, needing to plug that, that gap and, and fill that talent. So um, as you alluded to earlier, Lars, that was really the, the crossroads in, in my career where I decided, you know, do I want to continue doing this fun thing with viral marketing um, and continue coaching people and helping them you know, create content and stay in touch with their database and get referral and repeat business? Or do I really want to go out, um, take a big risk here and, and, and see if I can really solve this ISA problem once and for all? And so uh, that was the decision that I made. You know, I always say the definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. And so at that point in time, you know, there was the opportunity, but I wasn't very prepared for it. I'd, I'd never made a, a buyer lead follow-up call ever in my entire life. So at that point in time, I told Spring, I said, hey, go ahead and let the ISA get her license and we'll let her move up in the company and become an agent. And starting July 1st, 2013, I'll become your ISA. And so on that day, all the leads just started coming to me here in Texas. And so you're absolutely right that that first office which as you can see our, our headquarters behind us now, that first uh, Rockerbox office or world headquarters was, was me, myself and I operation. So it was me parked at a desk with a headset on and a mojo dialer and um, a couple beta clients and I just started making the calls myself. So it took me about a year and a half to two years to really figure out what the best type of call to make, the best type of scripts, the best type of objection handlers and really iron out a process where I could systematically say, hey, if you give me this amount of registrations, I can most likely create these types of opportunities for you. And so we started figuring out, making it very predictable, duplicatable business model. And then we started taking the service to, uh, to the market. That was about three, four years ago and started signing up clients very rapidly. But um, obviously, like you said, um, along the way, we've been growing a business. Um, and it's very fun to obviously have influence over uh, a business and the direction that it goes, but more importantly, the impact that it makes on people. And so I think today we're going to kind of cover some of those, some of those growing pains that we had initially. I mean, obviously everybody knows there's demand for someone making phone calls, but how you deliver that man and how you grow and scale um, is um, a lot different than, it's a lot easier said than done, so to speak. So yeah, I just wanted to, to join the group today and come on and, and just be completely transparent and share with you some of the mistakes that we've made and, and some of the, you know, the expensive, uh, pricey um, things that, 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 that we missed and then some of the wonderful um, profitable uh, strategies that we've implemented into just our business that have helped us grow our culture and, and, and grow our community here um, with a, a great foundation of success. Yeah. So let's, um, I definitely want to talk about uh, accountability. I want to talk about attracting uh, hiring and, and sort of onboarding because so people come to you, they're, they're not, they haven't been an inside salesperson for a real estate team for three years before they, they come to you with a, a they, they have the potential to be an inside salesperson, but you, mm -hmm. you, you create them basically. Exactly. I yeah. want to talk about, you know, how do you find them? Um, how do you train them? And then um, how do you manage them in a way that our, our members can learn from? Sure. Um, because I think that's where the struggle comes in a lot of times is that, you know, our, members as they're scaling, they decided they're going to be the business owner. They decided they're going to be the CEO. They're not, including myself, we're not necessarily qualified to do any of it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we just decide we're going to do it. And a lot of us, I happen to take the approach of I worked Boomtown alone for two years before mm -hmm. I hired my first, well, not quite two years, but a year and a half before I hired my first buyer's agent to come in and work it alongside me. And then I hired three or four more until I extracted myself from buyer leads. So, yeah. um, but a lot of our team member, our, our, our members, you know, they'll, they want to grow a team and they don't, they're not great at all the different skill sets. So yeah. let's break it down into, into kind of, uh, what do you guys look for when you hire new, new people? What does that process look like? That's a good question. So, uh, like I said, I basically spent about two years, like you said, learning Boomtown, learning the CRM, learning how to make the calls, learning how to do all the dials through Mojo, learning how to read all the reports and figure out, you know, where the, where the performance lies. But, uh, but essentially when I got to that point where I knew how to, how to follow up the lead and how to sell this to a real estate agent, at that point in time, I had to figure out, well, how can I actually scale this? And so a lot of people that I would talk to over the phone, they'd say, well, Josh, you sound great on the phone, but what do your people sound like? And so that was the first challenge in the business. Okay. I can do this, but can I, can I train someone else to do it? And so for the first step in hiring, I knew I had to start with good quality talent. Again, that's why we're right here in college station or parked right across the street from campus. You know, most of the kids that come to the school are in top 10% of their high school graduating class or in extracurricular everything. So it's a really great talent pool to start from, but now we have to narrow down and get more specific about who's actually going to be great at this type of work. And so we, we uh, have a great relationship with Texas A&M. We have a job posting up on their uh, career website. So we, so as soon as we were ready to hire, we put a job posting up there and something kind of ambiguous, like, you know, part-time real estate assistant, um, it didn't really say like, hey, you're going to get beat up on the phone all day long. And so, you know, we lured these students in to give us their resumes. Uh, we would send them the disc profile and have them send us their results as well as um, sort of, you know, response on how well they felt that that represented them. Because sometimes those disc profiles are hit or miss. But essentially, they take the disc profile. It's going to tell them, you know, how, they, how they're motivated and how they like to work. And then they write us a response on, hey, this, this did nail me on the head or this was a little off in these areas. But essentially what we're looking for in that disc profile is a high eye. Uh, we want to make sure that these people are, have that, you know, influencer, that life of the party type of personality, where there's really never an awkward moment. So as long as they score a 50 or higher on the eye, we knew that we would pass them through the next phase in the hiring process, um, which of course was a phone interview. And given the fact that we do work over the phone, that's actually a really, really, really great head start for us because they're going to have to have a good phone voice. They're going to have to have good tonality good enunciation. Uh, and so we, uh, we get to figure that out right on the very first phone interview. But essentially in the phone interview, we're just trying to figure out what their school availability is and if they'll actually be able to, you know, match the, the minimum requirements we have here for labor hours. But um, once we brought them in the door for an in-person interview, uh, you know, we had some general uh, interview questions, but my favorite always is, is the very beginning, you know, just kind of tell me a little bit about yourself. How'd you wind up here in College Station and where do you see yourself going in the future? Uh, because obviously we understand that this this position is not an end all position. Like I don't think I'm going to hire a college student here from from College Station and they're going to work for me for the next thirty years following up buyer leads. I don't think that's possible. So we know that this is going to be sort of a um, a jumping point or a launching pad to to wherever they want to go next in their life. So that's really really important that we find that out in the interview question. What are they studying? You know, where do they want to go after they graduate? What type of career do they want to get into? does this role have some opportunity for them to build those skills while they're still in school? Uh, and so we do an in-person interview. And then in the early days, we would say, great, you're going to be awesome. You're hired. And we'd bring them in on day one and we'd throw them at the phones and we'd throw them at the Mojo dialer and we'd start all their training until uh, one day we had um, a new employee come in for training. This was one of the first summers that we were hiring. And a uh, gentleman comes in for training. McKinley, she's one of our uh, early, early uh, rocker box family members and she was training this employee about 10 15 minutes into the shift he's like hey can I use the restroom so he heads off to go to the restroom and about 10 15 minutes later she's like I'm not quite sure where that guy went so she actually had to send someone to go check to see if the guy's still in the restroom or if he had actually left but her suspicions were were uh, confirmed that the guy had pretty much just bailed out 10 15 minutes into the role so at that point in time we realized that that we had kind of failed to set the expectations for what people were going to be getting into. You know, we were sort of scoping them out and determining whether or not we would think they would be a good caller, but we didn't actually tell them what they were going to be doing. So at that point in, in, in our uh, company history, we implemented one of the most important culture tools that we have, which is called our observation. And so in the hiring process, again, disc profile, phone interview, in-person interview, we can figure out if someone's going to be a good caller. More importantly, we want to know if this is something that they want to be a part of. 
So at the end of the interview, what we tell them is, you know, hey, Lars, we loved your interview today. Love all your qualifications on paper. We feel like you, you do a really good job job at the work that we do here. The next step, however, in our interview process is to invite you back for an observation. So we're going to schedule you for an hour with one of our most senior representatives, and they're going to give you a full tour of the business. They're going to show you all the technology we use, all the calls that we make, all the scripts, all the dialogues. They're going to show you exactly what an hour looks like in our office, the type of work that you're going to be expected to perform. And this is sort of your interview of us. So we want you to ask as many questions as possible get a full understanding of, of what is going to be expected of you. And at the conclusion of the observation, we hand them our business card and we say, send us an email and let us know whether or not you feel like you would be part of the family. And it's incredible. Some of the, some of the emails we get back from some of these students, I mean, it's essentially a persuasive essay at that point in time, them begging to have the opportunity to come into this environment and learn and grow and be challenged and, you know, uh, build off of others and, 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 and teach others and, and be a part of this experience here. So again, three, four years ago when we were doing the hiring, it was just a, simply a matter of like, hey, can you qualify and do you want to do the work? Now it's awesome because people actually get to come in and we walk around the office here and they see all the technology and they see all the team members and they see our huddles and they get to actually taste the culture and they get a real good taste of it before they actually come in here. So the observation is key. I would really, really, really recommend that you do an observation in any hiring process in your, in your business that people actually come in and taste what the actual real work is like. Not, not some shiny, fancy, marketed job position, but like this is the raw, actual, real deal, what's going to happen when you get your teeth kicked in and stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. We've added um, two steps along those lines. One is a working interview. So it's two hours um, where basically we train you ahead of time on one script and you come in and sort of fumble your way around just calling circle prospecting and then a group interview, which is essentially your opportunity just to see if you'll, you'd be a good fit. Yep. And that's, that's made a big difference for, yep. for us. Um, so, so, so someone passes all that with flying colors, they do the observation. Um, what, what does training look like? How, how quickly are they on the phones? What are the critical scripts? Like, how do you get them to be productive and money making for you as soon as possible? Yep. So now we've got like an awesome, like super thick, I wish I'd have brought one in here, but we have like a thick training manual that has every single training shift. We do four, four hour training shifts and it's one-on-one -on -one coaching because this can be an intimidating environment to be in. So we actually have some separate training rooms over on the side here. So those first couple shifts that, you know, they're fumbling and bumbling through, they're not necessarily put on the main stage here and being embarrassed in front of everybody. So it's four, four hour one-on-one -on -one training shifts. Um, we obviously do an orientation and they come in, they have homework and quizzes every single night, but they're essentially writing out parts of the script, writing out parts of the objection handlers um, and, and coming in every single shift with another homework uh, to perform. If they don't, if they don't do well on the quiz, if they don't do the homework, obviously they're sent home. They have to complete that before they come to the next shift. So that's, that's the basic training like outline, but the real beautiful part of how we got to this amazing, like systematic training process right now was actually, um, it started from about three, four years ago of us implementing a mastermind into our own company. So as soon as we, the first summer we started growing, we started hiring a bunch of students. Um, and of course in the summer, they've got a little bit more availability than in the fall. So they were all putting in a lot of hours. We were building the business together. We were, we were learning off of each other, off scripts and dialogues and objection handlers and things like that. But essentially what, what, what happened was once you start noticing more than one person doing the work, you realize there's more than one way to do the work. And so what we did was rather than just try to tell everybody to quit their creativity and, and only do it this way, instead what we did was quite the reverse of that, was we invited people to share their opinions, to share their insights, and to share their creativity. And so we actually started a Rockerbox company mastermind three years ago over just one large pizza. That's all it took. And the first three or four callers that I had hired, we basically, you know, we were basically passing the baton to cover the shifts because we're open almost 80 hours a week. So there weren't, there wasn't more than one person in the office. So the, the learning was, was pretty limited because you didn't have much overlap of ideas. And, um, and so what we did was we just said one evening, Hey, if everybody wants to come into the office, I'll buy a pizza. We can all come together and we'll share our ideas. And we literally went around the table and said, what are we doing well? And what can we improve on? And we've done that every single month for almost three and a half years now. So if you can imagine that team has grown from the first four people around a large pizza 
to now we have about 65 part-time callers and we basically have a whole stack of pizzas that we, that we gather around. But if you can imagine that brain power of inviting all those different people with different life experiences and different perspectives um, and different insights and you invite all those people in once a month into your business and say, what are we doing well? And what do we need to improve on? And almost every single script and dialogue and objection handler and process that's in that training manual now was derived from something that we identified in the mastermind as being an opportunity. And then we brainstormed and came up with some solutions for it. So now again, to look at it now, it's this super awesome polished procedure that we have. You know, a new person gets hired, they go through orientation, they get their book, they've got their own book with their name printed on, they've got their homework and their quizzes and all that other stuff. That might seem a bit intimidating to have something that polished right off the bat. And I guarantee you it wasn't like that. It was more like a five page Word document and it's grown into about a 90 page um, packet. Yeah. So just start somewhere. You got to start somewhere, but I encourage you to you know, invite your team members to give you their perspectives and give you their ideas. Cause they're going to tell you what they don't know well. And they're going to tell you that Susie does it a different way than I do it. And that creates inconsistency in your, in your business and you need to figure out the right way to do that. So start sharing those ideas, start doing a mastermind within your own organization. It'll literally cost you a pizza um, and start getting those ideas to start creating that, that, that training booklet. But that's essential. Everything has to be documented. It's got to be scalable. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I mean, you, you have to build this thing, no matter where you are now, <clears throat> you have to build everything with scalability in mind. And, mm -hmm. you know, we even, cause not everybody makes it, you know, we have like an eight week, you know, you basically earn your spot on the roster. And if honestly, a lot of people don't make it through the eight weeks and it's mm -hmm. because maybe, maybe they, we didn't filter them right at the beginning. Um, maybe that's good because the process was designed to get rid of them. Um, and then we also do an exit interview, you know, so we, we look to them for honest feedback about their, what, what didn't match, where do we let them down? You know? So I think if you could do that with your current, it's way better to do with your current people than yep. exit interview, but either yep. way, you're wanting to look at your business in a way where like when you started, it was just you and you, you had the vision of what was behind you. Yeah. And we're going to build it that way, even though it was one step at a time. And I think a lot of real estate team leaders, they don't like you, you were not equipped when you decided to launch Rockerbox. You weren't equipped to be an inside salesperson. You weren't equipped to be a manager. You weren't equipped to be a leader, but you were willing to do the thing you needed to do to get to the next step. So when you hired your first inside salesperson, you were equipped to train them because you had just done it for 18 months. Mm -hmm you know, you probably weren't the best manager for that person, but by the time you hired your second one, you were a little better manager because you messed up on the first one. Exactly. But you built, you, every step of the way, you put something in place, even if it was a half a page process document, you put it in place. Okay, now we're going to add a weekly team meeting or now we're going to add a daily huddle. These are the five points we're going to cover. Now we're going to add a quarterly thing. Now we're going to add a monthly mastermind. And if the same document started, the five page training is now, 500 pages or 50 yep. pages or whatever. Yep. So that, that's a big thing that I take away from, from, from your journey is that every step of the way, and it's the way that I built my real estate business, I built every little thing as something that was going to live forever. Yep. And it's, yep. it's, it's, it's the way you need to look at it. If, if you could talk about, um, I, I think there may be two questions, but I'll, I'll just throw it out there and see how you want to answer it. Um, a little bit culture, but, but I think accountability. So how do you get someone that probably doesn't know life yet? You know, we have, we have younger team members on our, um, on our team. And it, a lot of times it's hard to teach them like brush your hair and uh, you know, <laughs> brush the teeth and like, listen, I can tell you're hung over, get out of here. Yep. Um, stupid stuff like that. But then also like the culture and the pace and accountability and numbers and, tracking your numbers talk about accountability how is it positioned within the culture because a lot of team leaders in real estate world accountability is this like icky thing yeah the word itself for some reason has a negative connotation and i think that's because everybody got in this industry to be an independent contractor because they didn't want a boss right I, i'm a part of a lot of entrepreneurial mastermind groups and i and i love it whenever they pull everybody in the group and ask them why they're why they're an entrepreneur and the most common answers because they make a horrible employee. So uh, that's why a lot of people get into real estate is because they're horrible employees. And so they go out to be their own boss and be their own manager. And then all of a sudden they wake up one day and they're surrounded by a bunch of other 10 
99 contract employees and they somehow have to lead them and manage them. So you're right. The word accountability, I feel in real estate has a negative connotation. I love the word accountability. I embrace the word accountability. And one of the things that you hear me shout from the rooftops around the office here is that champions crave accountability. Think about that. Champions, right? Who won the Heisman this year? Who won the national championship the year before? Who won the Olympics, right? All of, all of those metrics that, that give a champion their title is accountability, right? It's passing yards or touchdowns or interceptions or the reason why there's lines painted on a football field, the reason why there is a scoreboard at the end of the football. That's all accountability. And if you're actually a champion, you want that, those numbers. You want to be reported. You want to know where you're at. You want to know where you stand above the competition, right? It's only the people that are afraid of their performance, that are afraid of their own skills, that don't want accountability because they don't want to be measured what their performance is, but, but champions, people that want to be better and want to grow and want to, want to, want to influence, they crave accountability. And so, you know, it starts with one of our core values is that we possess the mindset of a champion. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're learning that on day one when people come in here, what the core values are. But again, in the observation, one of the things that we're going to invite them in for is our daily huddle. And a daily huddle was something that we introduced about three years ago. We were growing the team. We had a lot of competition on the team, you know, guys trying to be better than the, than the person next to them. And, uh, uh, you know, the very competitive in nature. But as soon as school started in the fall, uh, all their extracurriculars picked up, all their schoolwork picked up. And a lot of them just looked at it as, hey, you know, this is just a part-time job. I can get one of these later on. My semester is pretty tough. And so we had a lot of them exit in that first fall of hiring and it hurt us, it hurt us pretty bad. And we realized that, you know, the competition that had been going on within the office had just been kind of self-initiated. And so we realized that we needed to go out of our way to demonstrate to everybody that the work that they were doing was meaningful, that it was impactful, that it was helping them grow as an individual, that it was going to help them grow their talents to get, to get multiple job offers when they walk the stage. And so that's when we actually imp implemented our daily huddle. So our daily huddle is a huge, huge piece that sets the tone right on before someone even comes in the door, before someone starts their shift. And essentially what we do in that daily huddle is we cover four things. Um, the first one is recognition. So again, if you, the only way that you can hold people accountable is if you recognize them, right? You have to, you can't just, you know, re record all your stats and then just ding people when they're in the red. You have to actually acknowledge when people do the things that you want them to do. So that's how our, our daily huddle starts off with recognition. So um, the way that our, our, our office is set up now is we actually have purposely separated our, um, our team into four separate teams so that we can actually compete against ourselves. Obviously, we don't have another rocker box office that we can go compete with. So we basically divided our office up internally so that we could track our own numbers and our own stats and sort of compete with ourselves so that one person's always gonna be the best and one person's always got room that they can improve on. But essentially that recognition piece of the huddle, we're gonna talk about those numbers every day. So opportunities, buyer percentage, seller percentage, uh, lender percentage, You know, how many opportunities are we identifying for your lender partner? Um, and then there's also sort of, uh, you know, daily recognition for top performers. Everybody sets their own goal uh, before their shift. So, you know, some people are on a higher level of skill than other people. So again, you only want to hold people accountable to the goals that they set for themselves. And so again, that recognition piece, we cover all the numbers, we give some shout outs, we recognize, recognize people for, um, giving a great effort. The second piece of the huddle is then our education where we go over the new things that are happening in the business with the, with the scripts, with the dialogues. The third thing is the connection card, where we actually share something personal about ourselves, something fun and interesting. And then the fourth thing to end the huddle is our motivation. Like I said, we set our goals for the shift. So at the end of the huddle, we're actually saying, hey, I'm gonna accomplish this today. And this is gonna be what my, what my goal is that you, my, my peer, can hold me accountable to and help me celebrate. And then we also have, I don't think you can see it on the screen, but there's several gongs laid around the, the, the office here. And when someone hits their daily goal, they go and strike the gong and then you hear a bunch of clapping and celebrating going on in the background. So just something as small as literally a daily huddle saying, here's what we did yesterday and what are you going to do today? And let's applaud and celebrate each other when we accomplish those goals. It's, it's really, really, really that simple as a start as like a really tool that you can implement tomorrow. Uh, and then it grows beyond that because obviously once you have people setting goals in the huddle, once you have squads that have different numbers, you can start creating competitions we also have individual competitions as well. So it's really just a matter of making sure that people understand that the work that we do is meaningful, right? That there is a positive result on the other side of all the grind that we're putting in here. And that, and that the efforts, the things that we're saying, hey, do these things, those are always being rewarded. 
And then more importantly, when you say, hey, don't do these things, that those things are actually being disciplined. And so I think that's the problem where a lot of people uh, kind of miss the accountability boat is they're saying, hey, do these things, great, high five. But then it's when they don't do the things that they're supposed to do and they're just like, eh, well, we'll just kind of sweep that under the rug and forget about that. So talking about some of those things that we don't do here at Rockerbox, um, as you can imagine, I have a bunch of 20 year old uh, young professional college students behind me um, who grew up with cell phones glued to their hands. Well, we actually have a cell phone locker in our office. So before you even walk in and clock in, every single one of our team members here takes their cell phone and locks it up in a locker. Because like you said, teaching these you know, people that may not know how to brush their hair, wear deodorant, or show up to work on time, that, that is an opportunity that we have here at Rockerbox is to start to teach and influence these young professionals things like, hey, when you show up to work, you're trading your time for money, right? And whenever you get your paycheck every two weeks, you get the full paycheck. So if you're going to get the full paycheck, I want the full effort. And so that's why we lock up our cell phones before we come into work. Because obviously we're working on phones all day long, but the productive work is when we're talking to buyers and sellers, not when we're texting our buddy about last night, you know, what happened at the bars. Mm -hmm. So they lock up their phones before they come into the shift. And that's, that's a, there's a zero tolerance for cell phones on the floor. Um, they do get a, a break every two hours so that they can go and reconnect with their cell phone and reconnect with their life. Um, and then we also have just simple attendance policies. You know, we understand one of our core values is you earn respect by demonstrating respect. And the only way that we can count on the work being done is if we can count on everybody here doing it. So we have very simple attendance policies as well. If someone shows up late, they, they essentially basically write themselves up in front of, in front of their peers. Um, you know, everybody understands that like nobody is more important than the other person. We all have stuff going on outside of work. We all have school and classes and social life and all that stuff. But when we show up here for work, it's time to work. And we're, again, we're trading our full time for our full paycheck. And so that's the type of efforts that we expect. So, you know, a cell phone locker is something that blows people's minds when they come into our office, um, an actual attendance policy that we actually follow. And again, it's three strikes and you're out. Luckily we've never had to fire anybody here though, uh, because people understand the importance of respecting their peers and showing up on time. So it is great to be able to have an opportunity to kind of uh, influence these young professionals and, and, and share some of those responsibilities and those accountabilities at a, at a young age. And was it, so I'm trying to think of, you know, our having that cadence, like it, it's impossible to scale a real estate team if you don't have a culture of productivity and everyone doesn't have daily goals mm -hmm. and we teach it and sometimes it doesn't translate. And I'm, I'm sort of a little bit perplexed, you know, why and how that could elude some of our, our, our team leaders, you know, or just the industry in general, when you're looking to grow your real estate business, if you're not tracking meaningful conversations, appointments set, you know, buyers and sellers met, buyers and sellers signed every day, at least two 1040, two a day, two set a day, 10 set a week, 40 set a month. You know, like if you're, that's the whole business. And then everything else you put around it, you know, will help you scale through culture. But you've got to start with that sort of, that sort of baseline. Um, and I don't think there's really a question there, except that, you know, we, we do a 7 a.m., um, check-in. So it's like a huddle. It's the same thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a seven twenty nine. We, we pray and then we role play as a team. And then eight o'clock, eight to 11 is protected time. And a lot of people cringe at that. And like, they couldn't do the structure of that. And I think it's because the team leader themselves struggles with accountability. Yep. Because if you're going to be in the office, if you know that, especially going into a shift, if you know how important it is to have consistency around new business development, but you're not inviting your team members to sit next to you literally, mm -hmm. you know, then what, like, what's the deal? How do you coach through that? Like I, and there's nothing, I mean, we're live inside our members group, but I'm admitting that this is like the psychological breakthrough yep. for you, you know, and you're, you're young and you started this when you were younger. Was it, how difficult was it to tell these, these whippersnappers, you know, like, Hey, listen, we're going to implement this locker. And I see you guys on your, did it start to get out of control? Because we, we have, you know, our cell phones are in a basket when they're in the hornet's nest, which is our mm -hmm. prospecting room. How, how did you, how did the accountability grow within you? Or was it just out of the gate? You were like, this job is hard. 
you got to get rid of your cell phone because I need you here a hundred percent. Did it start in the beginning or did you learn that you couldn't have anything but zero talk? Yeah, it started in the beginning. And just to kind of share, you know, talking about having influence over people based upon your knowledge of doing the work, like the first project again was spring saying, can you train my ISA? And so I lived in Texas, spring was in Utah. I flew out to Utah, spent some time working in our office side by side next to the ISA. But essentially once it was like, Hey, do all these things. Okay, great. You're going to do all these things. I'm going back to Texas now. That didn't work. I mean, it didn't work to just have this lone wolf ISA over in the corner somewhere. Josh from Texas who's going to call in every day and do some role play practice. Like it didn't work. Like the, the ISA was, was the only person doing their type of work. They had no support. They had nobody around them like doing phone calls, getting their teeth kicked in. And so it was very easy for that person to decide, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go be an agent. I want to show up to the office whenever I want to and cash big commission checks and not get beat up on the phone all day long. That looks like way more fun. And so when I started making the calls myself, you're right. I, I learned way more about the do's and the don'ts and how to actually scale the business. And I knew from the very beginning that it was going to be tough because it does require a lot of focus and it does require a lot of um, you know, dedicated time and, and lack of distraction. So when I started hiring those first ISAs, what I would actually do, I would be making the phone calls for most of the day and then they would come in to take over and make the phone calls. But I would literally, even if I was working on business type things, I would literally stand right next to them and listen to every single phone call that they made and hear every single phone conversation. And you know, you could, you can tell the way a phone, a phone call goes, even if you hear one side of it, We'd also plug in and listen to both sides of it. But it was those first couple callers that I had that you're right, that I basically said, okay, we need to remove all the distractions. You can't have the cell phone. That's a no go. You know, we have to, we have to come in off the bat, you know, focused, motivated and in the right mindset. So let's do some role play and some script practice. So it was really just kind of like, I knew the right things that I needed to be doing. And they were just kind of, I was just forcing them to happen, but it was, it was, it was a ton of micromanagement on my behalf. Like it was literally me being right there going, Okay, what did that person say? Okay, let's move. Okay, that's an interesting buyer situation. What category should we put that person in? And so again, by us learning together and having multiple people work the leads and having multiple experiences, we were able to get better insight into the business. But I don't know if I had if I had never actually done that, actually spent the year and a half, two years making the calls myself, and actually spent the next six months in the room with every single caller, listening to every single call and coaching them on it. I don't know how we would have been able to accelerate as quickly as we did. Um, but as far as the accountability piece, you're right. I mean, I knew from the beginning, can't have cell phones. You know, we got to be standing up. So you see, we have stand up desks out here. We've had stand up desks since the beginning of time. Um, they used to be hand constructed by myself. I went out to Home Depot and got some two by fours and used my terrible carpentry skills. But I knew we needed to be standing up. I knew we needed to have, um, you know, some high energy music playing in the background. I mean, all the hypothetical things, again, of how to create a productive work environment. I knew I needed those things. And so it was just a matter of like, just not ever letting it get to anything other than what we wanted the future of it to be. So even though we know, yes, now we obviously have no room for chairs and people are moving all around here and it would, it, it's not even questionable about whether or not people could sit down in the, in the office now. Well, three, four years ago, someone could have sat down in the office, but we didn't allow it. So, so that, that would just be my, that would be my advice there is that like whatever your future vision is of how this is going to scale, like you start there on day one, because then it just makes it so much easier to scale. Um, you know, if we had, if we had 60 employees in the office here and all of a sudden I introduced a no cell phone policy, it would be anarchy, you know, but every single one of these 60 callers, when they got hired on on day one, they signed the company policies and procedures document that let them know that, Hey, there's going to be a locker for you to lock your cell phone up and you get to use it on breaks. And so it doesn't become this huge thing because it's just, that's the way things are. And so you're right. I mean, it to, to long, long or short answer to my, my long uh, summary here is you got to start the way that you want it to scale to. So all those policies and procedures, you know, no distractions, no cell phones, don't sit down, have the high energy music, have your scripts, have your dialogues, exactly how you want it to be in the future is how exactly how you need to start. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we've got a couple minutes here. Um, what is, so, <clears throat> you know, we've got a lot of small teams in real estate B school um, and and I, I think it's this structure, cadence, accountability piece that's holding them back. What, what advice would you have for someone that's, that's scaled a business that can, continues to struggle with the day-to-day -day craziness? And there's no business that doesn't have craziness, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give for someone that's sort of on, the, on the, the front end of really getting after scaling a, a, a business? Even if it's not, you know, 
even if it's just tightening up five or six people, but what advice would you give to them as the team leader for any limiting belief or any, you know, I don't know, but, but what, looking back, what, what advice would you give somebody? So a lot, a lot of my uh, motivations and goals as an entrepreneur come from, uh, you know, the great old rich dad, poor dad book, Robert Kiyosaki that we all read, who knows how long ago, but the cash flow quadrant was really big to me. But, you know, as a, as a student in college, I studied entrepreneurship. Um, you know, after college, I worked at viral marketing, which of course, Frank Clezis is the founder and, and uh, CEO there, but I knew I was an entrepreneur. I just didn't have a business idea. Right. And so I, I had that blood in my body that said, I need to go create, I need to go influence, I need to go, um, you know, provide jobs for other people. But for me, the, the difference between being self-employed and being a business owner, that big jump from the left side of the quadrant to the right quadrant is as, as self-employed, you own a job. You can show up to it and you can clock in, you can make a bunch of money, but and you own that job. But the big differentiator between being self-employed and being a business owner is as a business owner, you own systems that people work for. That's like the most basic definition you own systems that people work for so if you're a business owner if you're a team leader like start writing down on a piece of paper what systems have you created what systems do you own that people work for because if you sit down and your piece of paper is really short and you're like well gary does this and susie does that and steve does this and bob does that that's just a group of individuals that's 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 a very much a uh, a team of generalists not a team of specialists and so that's that's the goal that's where you want to be as a team of specialists because that creates predictability, it creates scalability. And for me, one of the most you know, impactful stories that I always tell is that as I was growing Rockerbox over the years, I got to a point in my business where um, one of my best friends invited me to this trip uh, in Europe where we were gonna be on a yacht in remote islands for a week. You know, it was gonna be completely disconnected from cell phone and internet for a week. And so I booked it a year in advance. It sounded very exciting at the time, but about three, four months before the trip actually came up, I started to freak out because I realized there was too many things in the business that only Josh could do. And so I literally sat down and I made a piece of paper and it was things that only Josh can do. And I started writing down all the things that only Josh could do. And I realized what, what I had failed my people was I, I was, I trained them to do the job. Yes, but I didn't empower them to drive the business. And so at that point I basically took our, our, you know, top tier of leadership um, we went on a, a little cruise ourselves and did a, a little senior workshop so that we could define all those things that only Josh could do. And we created processes. We, we assigned and delegated them to certain people so that people could be specialized in those things. So I knew I'd actually gotten to a point where I was free and I could actually leave the business for a week, be completely disconnected from phone and internet and come back. And not only was it as successful, but it was more successful than when I had left it because I remember on that specific vacation, we signed up a couple clients and hired a couple employees and made a couple promotions in the time that I was gone. And so that for me was, was probably one of the greatest milestones that I've achieved in my life uh, was realizing that I actually owned a business at that point in time, because again, this was systems that I had created that people work for. And yes, people will come and go. And uh, we're super excited about all the career advancements that our, that our um, Rockerbox employees make. Um, but essentially what we know that we have to have at the end of the day is a set of systems that we can introduce new people to and they can come in and they can drink the Kool-Aid and they can become a part of the family and they can execute those tasks. And, and that's what we've got. We've got a scalable business there. So it's, it's again, a business is you own systems that people work for. So start working on those systems and start making that list of things that only you can do and start delegating them so that you can live your life and have a business that, uh, that, that you know, fulfills your lifestyle and, and, and uh, funds it as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right, brother. Appreciate you and uh, your support of real estate B school. And uh, I know the website's R O K R B O X.com. And it's Josh at rockerbox.com. If you guys have any questions um, just to, yeah, just, just seeing you growing what you're growing is, uh, is inspiring. And I know in the way you're growing it with the churn that you must have, it's sort of built into the business and still being, on point with your clients and sustainable and scalable is, uh, is, is freaking awesome. So congrats on all that. Yeah. appreciate it. Always a pleasure working with you in the community, real estate, BC community. Um, also if you guys don't like us on Facebook, um, be sure to check us out on Facebook because we do a live stream here in the office, uh, every couple months we'll, we'll introduce you to our huddles and our observations and our workshops and our masterminds and stuff. So Lots of cool stuff that uh, we like to invite you in on here. Not just internet conversion, but actual business building stuff. So um, that's always fun. Something I'm very passionate about. Love to share with the community here. 
Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lars. See you soon. All right. Bye-bye.